Welcome back to my channel. Today we'll be discussing the concept of fetal membranes and we'll be focusing on the amnion today. So fetal membranes are extraembryonic coverings which come from the inner cell mass and the blastocyst cavity. So they form part of the products of conception and there are four components that form the fetal membranes. You have the amnion, the yolk sac, allantois and the chorion. So in this video we'll be discussing the amnion today. Then in the subsequent videos we'll talk about the other three. So the amnion forms within the second week of development by migrating amnioblasts and it's derived from the epiblast layer. So you get this fluid from either the fetal side or the maternal side. From the maternal side you have diffusion via the placenta. From the fetal side you have production of urine by the fetus. Then you also have fluid secretions from the lungs, the skin and the GIT of the fetus. So at Near term, you usually have the fetus producing about 500 to 1200 milliliters of urine, and it will actually swallow about 210 to about 790 milliliters of amniotic fluid per day. So, the functions of this amniotic fluid is majorly thermoregulation, shock absorption, lubrication of the skin and the vaginal canal during birth, promoting lung expansion by preventing the collapse of the airways and promoting symmetrical growth of the fetus with musculoskeletal development. So the fate of the amniotic membrane of fluid is usually normally the rupture of the membranes at term. Sometimes it can happen prematurely and therefore it will be expelled, expelled with the placenta as what you call afterbirth. Now the clinical relevance of this amniotic membrane is that we can use uh, the amniotic cavity and the fluid to actually test for genetic diseases within the fetus via amniocentesis. Then there's a the concept of too little or too much amniotic fluid. And then there's what we call the amniotic band disruption syndrome. So oligodramnos is where you have too little amniotic fluid. So it's actually less than expected for gestational age. It's usually about less than 500 milliliters. Now the causes of this will either be teratogenic drugs demise of the fetus, so you'll have no urine being produced. Renal agenesis, no urine being produced. And then you can have intrauterine growth restriction. Placental insufficiency means from the maternal side there is no tissue uh, diffusion uh, fluid. And then there is also premature rupture of membranes. That means the amniotic fluid comes out. And then there are chromosomal abnormalities such as trisomy 13 or Patau syndrome and trisomy 18 or what is known as Edwards syndrome. So these are complications of oligodramnios. Here you have contractures of the limbs of this fetus. So these are the upper limbs in contractures. You also have contractures of the lower limb there. Then here you have what you call porter fasces. So the porter fasces you have the beaked nose, the prominent epicanthal folds and the low set ears. So if I to draw a line from the lateral canthus horizontally, you see that these ears are actually below the level of the eyes. And so these are low set ears. And then you have pulmonary hypoplasia. They are uh, less developed. The polyhydramnios is where you have amniotic fluid being more than expected for gestational age. The causes being maternal diabetes mellitus, maternal congestive cardiac failure. It could also be idiopathic. 50% of polyhydramnios is unknown in terms of its causes. And then fetal causes will have central nervous system anomalies. So you have that the neural component of swallowing not being there. So remember the fetus has to swallow this amniotic fluid. And so if they are not able to swallow the amniotic fluid, then they are not able to also produce that urine. Gastrointestinal anomalies also, for example, esophageal atresia, duodenal atresia means that even if the fetus swallows, there is no way that that fluid can be uh, absorbed in the gastrointestinal tract. Then multiple gestation actually means that if you have two amniotic sacs with twins, each amniotic sac with its own amniotic fluid, then the total capacity will be increased. Or if you have twins sharing the same amniotic sac producing urine, Within the same amniotic sac, you'll have polyhydramnios. And then now there is the famous uh, trisomies. 
So these are complications of polyhydramnios. You have, can have premature rupture of membranes. Okay, this is what you call cord prolapse. So the umbilical cord will prolapse the vaginal canal and usually this will predispose the fetus to something we call perinatal asphyxia. Basically suffocation because of compression of the umbilical cord, which is the prominent uh, supply of oxygen to the fetus. Then you have this true knot of the umbilical cord. So this is the umbilical cord, that's the placenta. And so here the cord has formed a true knot. And so there is the cutting off of oxygen uh, supply to the brain of the fetus. And that is one of the main consequences uh, of perinatal asphyxiation. Then there is the concept of the nuchal cord. So nuchal refers to the neck. So the umbilical cord tying around the neck. And this also contributes to perinatal asphyxiation. Now the amniotic band syndrome is a spectrum of anomalies where you have the amniotic membrane being disrupted and entrapping multiple fetal body parts. So this is an example. So you have the amniotic membrane here and you can see it's sending out septations and they're actually cutting off supply of blood to these uh, distal extremities, the hand and the foot there. And so this is how usually they present. So you have this amniotic band constriction at the level of the leg and so just near the ankle this foot will actually uh, amputate because there is constriction of blood supply to that foot. Now this is where you have it uh, on the arm and also constricting all the way to the head. Thank you for listening and if there is any question you can put them on the question, uh, comment section below.